in the last 12 months or so, I've had the opportunity to speak to some of the themes I'm going to address tonight through talks to the Wallace Collection, the Museum Ethnographers Group, Stirling University History and Heritage Studies students, and the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. So I'm grateful to be able to take some shortcuts and draw on those papers because I had very little time to put this together. So let me start with a quick look at some definitions and applications around the word resource. Uh, definitions, of course, are always useful when a little emergency padding is needed, uh, but with a word such as resource and the issues it opens out, so wonderfully unpacked by contributions we've heard today, and I'm sure we'll hear tomorrow, then I feel it's also warranted. From these definitions, I'll jump off into the museum archaeology context and alight on some of the projects I've been involved in during my work in the Scottish cultural heritage sector. I won't wander too far down memory lane and in the main, weave in and out of the cultural biography uh, uh, of uh, material culture, contested objects, and the ongoing development of the new museum in Perth. So then, some definitions. I won't read any of these out. You can do that for yourselves. The upshot is that museums and archaeology can be defined as resources from a number of directions. Often they're referred to as cultural or heritage resources, often with a need to be managed as such. The conventional subtext of resource is an economic one, and whilst museums certainly do have an, econ an economic role to play as resources for community investment and to help uh, encourage economic generation, that's, that's not the only story. It's a small part of their character, and unlike wealth generation, they are non-renewable -renew and culturally precious. They need to be conserved to maximize their impact and sustainability. Collectively, they are the cultural reserve and social memory of a country. It's conventional to make a distinction between collections, those who work in museums, and those who visit. But I would incline to dissolving this, this construct. Certainly, we can say that staff are an essential resource as much as our collections. But we can go further and say that bringing these three dimensions together creates a network of people. People then, people now, and people tomorrow. A network that collapses together ingenuity, quick wits, cultural assets, and a leisure occupation into something that is continually morphing and resurgent in the face of often more absent resources in the way of undervaluing, under-prioritizing, and under-investing, be it political or economic. Implicit in this, I hope, is that there is no sh shortage of the who, what, where, when, and why of the resource equations on which museums are built. You will all know many of them from your own experiences. Some of those that I know are implicit in the narrative I now turn to weave, which threads together the past and the future of Perth Museum, colonial legacies, and post-colonial futures. The question of contested objects and human remains and the value of cultural biography. Our research for the new museum in Perth includes a re-evaluating of our long history of collecting across nearly four centuries. The museum's first iteration, the Literary and Antiquarian Society, built the first museum, the Rotunda, paid for by public subscription and including a monument to the former provost, historian, military commander and society member Thomas Hay Marshall. It remains part of the current museum. The Society ceased operation and transferred its museum and collections to the Perth Town Council in 1914. It has remained a local authority responsibility ever since, including an extension in the mid-1930s, paid for by a bequest from Robert Gruff. Local government has changed several times and currently the museum is the responsibility of Perth and Kinross Council which for the last five years has been, uh, has been through the mechanism of a cultural trust, Culture Person Kid Ross. Planning for the new museum began in 2017, and the current opening is scheduled for 2024. The details of this is a separate talk, some of which I presented to uh, uh, the SMA at our 219 conference in Chester. So this slide just gives a kind of recap, a wee flavour 
uh, with the project rooted around the conversion of the former City Hall. Within the re-evaluation being undertaken, a key issue is the colonial legacy of the primarily 19th century collecting under the auspices of the Perth Literary and Antiquarian Society. And I'll, I'll say a bit about them now. Seeking a high-profile and well-connected figurehead for their new venture, founded in 1784, the Perth Literary and Antiquarian Society persuaded David Stuart Erskine, 11th Earl of Buchan, to become their first president in 1785. He gifted this portrait to the society. He was fond of gifting portraits of himself, uh, noting that the frame was made of the oak which sheltered the great Sir William Wallace in the tall wood. Erskine's reference to and reverence for the oak seems entirely appropriate to the antiquarian aspirations of the society, but it is an element that is also cautionary. The tall wood, or Wallace oak, was legendarily associated with, with William Wallace in the 13th century, its hollow trunk supposedly serving as his headquarters, hiding place, and sleeping quarters. By the 17th century, the tree was being used to make Wallace souvenirs, which led to its decay and loss. By 1830, it was described as badly affected by the removal of timber and reduced to a single stump. Souvenir hunters resorted to digging up its roots, and by 1835, it was dead and gone. Buchan had clearly ensured his supply of the wood, as before the frame for his portrait, and no doubt others, he used some of the wood to make a snuff box in 1782, which he presented to U.S. President George Washington in 1791 to demonstrate that American democratic practices had their roots, quite literally, in Wallace's actions. One of the key founders of the Perth Society uh, was the Reverend James Scott, shown here in his 1790 portrait. In his hand, he holds a copy of the preliminary discourse that he authored and read at the foundation meeting of the Science Society on the 16th of December, 1784, when he met with seven other men, including another three ministers, in a room of the old Perth Academy building. This overlooked what was known as the College Yards, the site opposite the medieval parish church of St. John's, where Scott was minister. The yards and their surrounding buildings and markets were demolished to make way for the City Hall in 1844, demolished and rebuilt in 1909, and it is that later building which will become the new Perth Museum. Scott's preliminary discourse was given more concrete form nearly two years later with its publication for members as a series of subjects for illustration, a sort of proto-archaeological agenda, a coherent list of questions of research for the members to address. Roman and Caledonian relations seem pertinent given the weight of research, given the weight, sorry, of the Roman earthwork remains in Persia sparking such questions as the state of this country at the time of the Roman invasions. Consequently, the society appointed in 1789 a subcommittee to map Persia's Roman roads and encampments and also acquired a seven-volume copy of, copy of Tacitus regarded as the definitive text on the ancient state of northern Britain. It remains a pertinent subject for the Scottish research agenda. A new exhibition exploring the presence of Rome in Persia ran throughout 2021, and these questions and many others inform the ongoing Scottish archaeological research framework managed by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. As it grew, the Perth Society, the Perth Society remained entirely male in its membership. The great and the good of local Persian society drawn from the nobility, landed gentry, clerics, and successful businessmen, especially in Perth. Their twin purpose was discourse. They held regular meetings where members were encouraged to present their researches, their papers then added to the society's library and archives, most of which we still have, and to avidly collect books, manuscripts, coins, natural history, antiquities, and miscellaneous curiosities. 
The Society's key early drive was to act as a counterpoint to the professional academic circles of Edinburgh, which they kind of despised. With an overall ambition of propagating patriotic amateur antiquarians as against a coterie of specialist professionals in the metropolis, so that a solid and trustworthy national culture could flower. The three strands might be summarized as broadening antiquarian study to include natural history, philosophy and the fine arts, and native Scottish literature. Buchan was very much of the school of natural history as antiquarian pursuit, including its collecting, which like other collecting pursuits, he had a colonial aspect, part of the defining and owning of knowledge as a white hegemony, encompassing the natural world and the cultural world. The giant fir tree seen here is one of those planted by the Duke of Athol in Persia from the collecting of Scottish Persia botanist David Douglas, an active rival of another Persia botanist, Archibald Mengus. Many of the species they brought back to Scotland and Britain were named to them, part of the colonial corralling of uh, foreign ecosystems. I include here two of the coast salish names from, from Canada for the same tree. Playasep and Shibidos. Uh, plantings such as at the Hermitage near Dunkeld were also part of imagined landscapes that fused such colonial collections with, in this case, Scotland's romantic antiquarian past, specifically in this instance around uh, what are known as the Ossian poems. Pursuing philosophy and the fine arts affirmed the society's view of itself as an Edinburgh alternative, whose intelligentsia appeared open to question on both moral and patriotic grounds. Scott, in particular, wanted to ensure the society's epistemological orthodoxy was distinguishable from what he saw as the wild and dangerous doctrines, free of religious constraints, expounded in recent decades by some of the philosophers based in Edinburgh. Perhaps the key founding acquisition for the Society's art collection was the 1820s donation of six paintings given by the Earl of Ormelly, later the Marquis of Bredorbin, on his becoming the MP for Persia. The paintings were all of the late 17th century Neapolitan school, including a Caravaggio. Space being at a premium, these paintings were kept and displayed at the City Hall, which also hosted occasional exhibitions of the other collections. The Battle of the Amazons, which you see here by Giacomo Farelli, is described with the other paintings in the 1881 history of the society, where it is noted of this painting that it has always seemed to us that this picture affords, a valuable materials, affords valuable materials for study, more especially to those enterprising ladies who boldly leave the accustomed track of their predecessors and seek for their Elysian fields in women's rights, anatomical rooms, scientific societies, et hoc genus omni. And this seems like a really supportive statement of female equality, but it's from a society that appears to have been resolutely entirely male and, and never admitted any female members as far as, as I've been able to ascertain. As for Scotland's native or, or, or Gaelic or literature, the society valued this as against the best ambivalent attitude of Edinburgh's anglicising literati, and undoubtedly a factor in the society's change of name from the antiquarian to the literary and antiquarian society. The society's achievements here were somewhat more tangible than with their pursuit of scientific experiments and philosophy, largely due to, due to the active publishing scene in Perth. The society included a coterie of members who collected their Gaelic culture, led by a group of Highland clergymen, notably James McLagan of Blair Athol Parish. Many delivered papers at society meetings, and these were duly archived. A sustained period of success for the society saw membership rise from the founding eight to 206 by 1827, uh, all of them white men. The collection also grew quickly, but the limited nature of the accommodation available to the society meant it was poorly looked after, and many of the donations and manuscripts 
presented prior to 1819 have been lost, to quote the Society of Transactions published in 1827. By the early 19th century, there was an urgent need for dedicated museum premises. A proposed monument to local worthy Thomas Hay Marshall provided the solution, with Marshall helping to fund the monument so that it could include rooms for the society, of which he was a member, and also for the library. As soon as 1833, anxieties about the lack of space were voiced and a subcommittee formed to promote the cause of an extension. It stalled several times until the 1860s when the campaign joined forces with that to create a Perth Albert Institute as a memorial to Prince Albert. A new joint body was proposed with the extension to be built behind the monument. However, it founded on lack of money. The Albert project contented itself with a statue on the North Inch, and the museum had to content itself with a redecoration, the installation of a heating system, and a limited redisplay of the collections. The scheme for an extension was renewed in the 1870s. A proposal to convert the city hall was found unsuitable, and that for new rooms behind the Mon Mon Marshall Monument put forward following the plan shown here. Again, money was wanting. The land around the monument did not become the much-desired extension until the 1930s, when a wealthy benefactor left money to the town council for that prescribed purpose, giving the museum its current footprint. In the meantime, the society had basically run out of steam and transferred its museum and collections to the town council in 1914. These are, these are, there are very few photographs of the museum interior, and these are the earliest to survive. They may have been taken in the first decade of the 20th century, probably preserving the layout of the exhibitions uh, as it was when the society reached its end. The displays may well have remained in this form uh, down to the building of the extension and the re-display that that afforded in the 1930s. I turn now to look at the question of research and resource. I alluded to the importance of research above, and the collection is a key resource for this, allowing the revisiting of long-held questions to understand them in a new light. This late Bronze Age sword is one of the earliest acquisitions of the society, made in 1785. It's instructive in both society practices and the value in studying old collections. It appeared to have been lost, uh, as the museum catalogue as at 2000 did not list it, leaving only its acquisition entry. 1785, Roman sword found in the River Forth with a piece of human skull attached to it. Donor, Mr. Coldstream of Creef. What was in the collection was a sword from Creef, said to come from a grave, but otherwise poorly provenant. Working with Trevor Cowie at the National Museum in Edinburgh, we were able to untangle a mix-up whereby the sword was initially identified as Roman, when in fact, as, as you'll have gathered, it was Bronze Age, and at some point was divorced from its context and became identified as coming from Crete, where the donor came from. Uh, Trevor and I published the untangling, situating the understanding of the sword in Bronze Age votive practices. The society's already noted interest in the Roman past rather cast the indigenous people of ancient Scotland in a role parallel to that of the indigenous peoples of the 18th and 19th century world, with Rome the earlier iteration of the British Empire. It was searching through the society's papers on the Roman past that I came across an account of a Roman sword found in the River Forth, which sparked the re-evaluation. The sword's donation prompted this account uh, by the Reverend Dow of Methven, which uh, I'll quote in summary. The weapon presented by Mr. Coldstream was found in the fourth, near a place called Cambus, about halfway between Stirling and Alloa. It was accidentally entangled in a fishing net and pulled ashore, with part of a human skull fixed on its point. This warlike instrument, the author of the Itinerarium, calls a Roman gladius. Mr. Gordon gives drawings of two weapons of this sort, one of which was found on the Roman wall in the parish of Caridon and is deposited in the Advocates' Library, and the other was discovered somewhere in Ayrshire 
and belonged to the collection of the late Mr. Woodson. The last is exactly similar to ours, having the point in the handle also broke, but is longer by a few inches. That this weapon, which, which we may call a gladius anceps, belonged to the Romans, seems also probable from the one discovered on the Roman wall. We are left entirely to conjecture when we pretend to account for a human skull being found upon its point. Perhaps in some of the skirmishes between the Romans and the Caledonians on the banks of the Forth, a legionary soldier, having slain his adversary, might, in the wantonness of cruelty and insult, cut off his head and pick it in triumph on the point of the sword. But while thus indulging the barbarous pride of victory, might meet with some brave Caledonian, eager to revenge perhaps the cause of his friend, and the haughty Roman, unable to maintain an unequal combat, might rather choose to commit his bloody trophy to the adjacent river than to suffer the mortification of seeing it fall into the hands of the victor. But, in points of this kind, everyone is at liberty to frame his own conjecture. In interpreting the sword as a Roman weapon, Dow was, ma- was working with the, within the main contemporary framework for understanding the past that provided by literary sources, principally in the form of the Bible and the works of classical authors. Dow's splendidly romantic account of the sword draws upon an imagined account, uh, uh, encounter between Roman and Caledonian to explain the circumstances of the discovery. The society's Roman fascination has already been remarked on, and that was also rooted in Renaissance thought, which looked to a classical past, and so it seemed only natural for early antiquarians to turn to Greek and Roman authors to discover the date and origin of the bronze swords that were turned up by the plowman or the builder. The belief that these swords dated to the Roman occupation of Britain was to linger on into the late 19th century. This late medieval chandelier has been in the Perth collections since 1812 when it was purchased by the society. At the time, it was said to have hung above the altar of the Shoemaker Guild in St. John's Kirk. It still hangs in the kirk, now in front of the altar of remembrance, as it's been on loan there since the completion of Lorimer's restoration in the 1920s. Putting it on display in the museum a few years ago as part of a medieval Perth exhibition afforded the opportunity for much, a much closer look at the chandelier than is possible than has been possible for many years. Here we can see uh, the entire chandelier comprising 12 branches, which represent the the 12 apostles, surrounding its central figure representing the Virgin and Child as Our Lady of the Sun, Beata in Maria Sole, as described in the Book of Revelations. This Marian iconography may suggest it originally lit the Lady Chapel or one of the Marian altars. There were many kinds of bronze, brass, and ceramic lamps used to light medieval churches, but by the 16th century, perhaps the commonest was the multi-branched chandelier of this time. The majority appear to have been made in workshops in the Low Countries in Germany. However, very few have survived, not least because the metal was a valuable commodity, and following the Reformation, many were melted down for reuse. The altars of St. John's Kirk are likely to have been lit by several of these chandeliers, but this is the only one to survive. Or is it? Actually, what this example appears to be is a chandelier made up of the parts from several chandeliers. The parts probably escaping total destruction during the Reformation, possibly by design rather than accident, and then brought back into use possibly in the 17th or 18th century. The surviving elements put back together to make one chandelier. It's very elaborate. It's a separate paper, really. It's too elaborate to go into. But basically, there's a whole series of marks which connect the arms to uh, to the central baluster, and you can see there's a sequence of three or four different sets of marks. But, so they're clearly not uh, re- re- relating to one episode of use, but several as they made branches fit uh, where they thought they should go. The prompter of much, but not all, of the damage done to the fabric and furnishings of St. John's Kirk is historically put down to the somewhat incendiary speech made by John Knox from its pulpit in 1559. 
On the right of this slide is the painting required by the Society, which includes Knox as a great reformer. The iconoclastic attentions of the mob's reforming zeal would no doubt have included the likes of the chandeliers discussed above. The Society had a keen interest in Knox because of his physical presence in Perth and the changes wrought by the Reformation. In 1832, two different objects were brought to the attention of the Society, which it was excited to acquire. A 16th century brass candlestick, said to have belonged to John Knox, and be the very one that deflected an assassin's bullet fired through the window of his Edinburgh house. The second is a walking stick, or, or staff, said to have been used by Knox in his old age and passed down to his family. The Society made their initial record in their minute book as both objects were separately offered to the Society at the same meeting, which caused an element of great excitement. Further background is detailed in the Society's register and corresponding uh, correspondence files, establishing lines of succession for these objects and indicating their retention as relics and memorials with an implication that they were shown to people uh, uh, throughout that history. So a sort of underground uh, relicization. When the Perth Handbook appeared in 1848, the relics were by then a staple of the displays and described as one of the highlights to go and see in Perth. How long they remained on display is unclear, but they seem to have faded into obscurity in terms of public attention, perhaps encouraged by curatorial skepticism. Uh, and I'm currently completing an, an, a re-evaluation of these, of these two objects. Uh, especially in the light of the much more recently recognized phenomenon of Reformation relics, particularly for people like Luther. The handbook, incidentally, also describes the cost of a visit, free if you were a guest of, the member, of a member, sixpence for a group of up to eight if you were unaccompanied by a member, with the museum open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 1 till 3 p.m. And uh, shown in... Um, talks about the acquisition of, uh, the legitimate acquisition of uh, objects from abroad as, as trophies of war, which is something we'll, we'll come back to. I want to move away briefly now from the society to a subject prompted by the artifact research just summarized, cultural biography, an approach to material culture that sits under the wider umbrella of social archaeology and social anthropology. It seeks to grapple with the changing meanings of objects as they move through changing uses and reuses within different social contexts. The founding head of this scholarship is generally cited as the work of Apadurai and Kopitov within the anthropological volume, The Social Life of Things, published in 1988. This influential study sought to recognize that the meanings people attribute to things derived from human motivations and transactions determining their use and circulation. Things can thus be said to have or accumulate a social life. The interface of the biographical concept with wider material culture theories has led to a dissatisfaction among some theorists that biography does not sufficiently recognize the agency of objects, or rather, a self-agency of things is preferred to an attributed or perceived agency applied by humans. Some recent critiques have therefore suggested that the focus should be on the movement of these objects as an aspect of their agency, leading to the adoption of terms including object itineraries, things in motion, and multiple artifacts. The concept, if not the name, has older origins and can be found at work in popular culture, in both films and literature, for example, where narratives are presented and driven by powerful objects. The novelist and critic Italo Calvino engagingly summarized some of this around the roles of powerful objects such as magic rings and swords within fairy tales and legends. Earlier, Calvino had also illuminated the broad arc of how cities change through describing those changes through the lens of reuse, recycling, and the agency attribution 
of material culture. The spectrum of his writings serves as a sort of pre-echo of uh, the, the, the scale range at which biographical approaches are applied in archaeology, from single objects and fragments up to buildings and monuments and landscapes and cityscapes. The first slide, uh, uh, sorry, this slide uh, reminds us that such trajectories and itineraries of biographical accumulation, if you like, uh, life ways in stone, are ongoing and organic. This statue in Munich is a 19th century commemoration of the 16th century composer, Roland de Latre, who spontaneously was converted to a shrine to another musician, uh, pop star Michael Jackson, on his death in 2009. It's not, our, it's not only our own dear clue that excites this kind of response. In terms of picture sculpture, which is a particular research theme of mine, a partic uh, uh, the approach can be applied to single monuments and to groups of monuments and can help to track change over the early medieval period and also across a much longer durée. The map shows some of the examples I've worked on, and I won't be going into this in great detail. This slab from Crief was commissioned in the 9th century. It originally stood a few miles from Crief at a small place called Straun, which was the later center for the earldom of Strathern, as it was known. It became the market cross for Straun and was moved to Crief in the early 19th century as part of a drawing in of local markets to bolster trade in Crief, at which point it became the Creefborough Cross and a meeting point for a range of personal and social needs. On the outskirts of Perth, on the Dublin estate, stands the Goodly Burn Cross. This has only been there since the 1950s, when it was moved from Lethem in Perth in advance of the building of a council housing estate. Since the 18th century, its changing condition has been captured in antiquarian drawings and accounts, from which we know that in the 16th and 17th century, it was used as a starting and finishing point for a horse race to Methven, and later was a well-known haunt of playing children. It may have originally marked a late 10th or early 11th century estate boundary, and then the limits of the medieval Perth Borough Muir, or Market Fair possibly associated with the gallows. Following its move to Dublin, the graffiti initials that we can see were added. Turning to uh, assemblages of sculpture, here we see two of the elements from uh, a place called St. Middies, a few miles downstream from Perth on the River Tay. This 8th century cross slab and the earlier symbol stone are the key elements. The various orientations of the carved symbols on the symbol stone suggest modifications of meaning and purpose for a stone that came to be used as a cover for a kissed burial. The addition of ohm inscriptions on all the narrow edges may coincide with the creation of the cross slab as part of the Christianization of an originally Bronze Age cemetery and including an early church dedicated to the cult of St. Medoch. As we saw with Goodly Burn, modern graffiti has been added to the entire stone since its discovery in 1945. And I hope you can just make out the love heart there with uh, Cass and I can't remember the chap's name. But that was added when it first went on display in the museum. <coughs> These two pieces are now in the museum collections and will be on display in the new museum. Around both, we are pursuing research themes to explore the use of colour on early medieval sculpture. And that's where the first video comes in. We're doing so digitally with the computing team at the University of St. Andrews uh, through Sharon Bissani's ongoing PhD. Uh, we have devised a color palette and applied it to both stones. We will be digitally projecting color onto the big cross lab uh, and visitors will be able to explore the issue on a touch screen, including selecting their own color scheme if they want to. 
We also uh, will also extend the storytelling possibilities through the digital resource by play, placing these digital models in a recreated historic environment. Longer term, we hope visitors will be able to haptically move around in these uh, environments. That's a bit a bit further off. We're also using digital reconstruction more widely in the interpretation with a selection of archaeological landscape reconstructions for key moments in time, and these will fill large wall spaces in the gallery. We're also planning a series of gender-balanced digital facial reconstructions to more readily communicate scientific knowledge and more emphatically link back to our social ancestors. So this is a face of a chap, uh, a pict buried at Blair Athol. And I now realize as I go to the next slide that I forgot to give you this as a video. So I don't know, let's see what happens there. This is a very shortened version of the process of reconstructing the face that, that uh, people will be able to uh, access on, again, on touch screen. <coughs> we'll have about seven of these all together, different uh, and gender balanced at the time. Help, I'm trapped in a box. So, returning briefly to Pictish stones, the assemblage I've most recently worked on is that in Fortivia, close beside the River Urn, just to the southwest of Perth. The Pictish royal site with high status church, possibly monastic, and articulating a re relationship with earlier ancestral power consciously using the prehistoric remains at the site to help define its rooted sense of power. The boundaries of the site were defined by at least two large crosses, the Duckling Cross, as we now, or as we now call it, the Cross of Constantine, and its opposite number to the south of the site, the so-called Invermay Cross, which survived until the early 19th century, when it was broken up by the landowner. Its base survives in situ with a post-destruction uh, guilt assuaging obelisk inserted into it. Other fragments were accumulated at the parish church, and our analysis interprets, interprets them as representing four huge monumental crosses. They share a rhetoric of royal power, deploying motives of King David from the Bible and the Constantinian, Roman Emperor Constantinian imperial rider, in conjunction, uh, power in conjunction with the church. The assemblage is dispersed. There's also a, an architectural arch, which is unique in what we call Pickland, and that's now in the National Museum. And there's a cross slab containing a, a free cross form in the grounds of a gas house, which, which is probably related to this group. A positive outcome of the project beyond the publication and temporary exhibition that we that we held on, on the excavations there is the new chapter in the trajectory of the sculpture fragments in Fortiviate, where they have now been redisplayed and where the completion of the whole project was marked by the carving of a new picture stone. You might say a resource shared and renewed. The sub theme of movement will be picked up at various points in the new museum displays, uh, including for deep prehistory. Uh, the travels of such precious stones as these jadeite axe heads from Italy to Scotland. So I'll turn now to another sub theme 
uh, contested objects. This is another critical aspect of the biography of early medieval sculpture and material culture more widely. Uh, <coughs> It's a rich resource for debate in the museum if approached in the right way. I want to turn to look at this now, focusing on what will be one of our star objects in the new museum, the Stone of School, or the Stone of Destiny as it's known, consider some wider implications and then return to the Literary and Antiquarian Society and their colonial collection. By contested, I mean debates and disputes over memory and meaning mediated through materiality. Nothing new there, but it seems a very fitting moment to consider contestation, where right now uh, uh, every word in the English language seems to be up for grabs. Uh, what is a party? Uh, what is truth? What is responsibility? Uh, of course, with a contest generally, those involved seek to win. Would the debate be better framed or defined as a dialogue? where all sides are looking for an answer rather than a victory. Museums are, in essence, where the past, both its physical remains and their changing interpretation and understanding, are enshrined. Every dimension of this is contested to varying degrees. And, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll pass on this slide and the next one. Uh, the, uh, I'll just leave you with uh, a ghostly echo of those. Just to cut some time out. The specific context framing my uh, current entanglement, if you like, with these debates is the development of the new museum. This is itself a contested reuse of a historic building, the old city hall, which will be transformed into a new museum telling the historical and archaeological story of Perthington Ross. It's full of contested objects and remains not the, the centerpiece loan I've already referred to, the Stone of Schoon. This superficially unprepossessing piece of material culture is for many a pivotal symbol in the relationship between Scotland and England as independent nations. It too articulates colonialism, not least in its being a piece of medieval war loot a mechanism by which much material made its way to Britain during 19th century empire building. Uh, get used to this. Uh, you will see it in the next few weeks because it has to return from Edinburgh Castle, where it currently is, to Westminster, so that uh, King Charles can be uh, crowned. Well, I say get used to it. You won't actually see it because it fits in a slot in the coronation throne, and then it's covered by cushions and things. It, you won't see it, but it will be there. I touched on the importance of movement above in facilitating the accumulation of her biography, and for the Stone of Schoon, it is absolutely integral. This slide shows the cover of, of a popular 1950s account of the stone, its map capturing the mythic movements that variously originated the stone in the Holy Land as Jacob's Pillar, and in Egypt belonging to Scota, daughter of Pharaoh, from where it journeyed to Spain, Ireland, and Scotland, which of course comes from Scota. Beside it, the more localized movement out of Westminster Cathedral, where it was placed after its theft from Schoon by Edward I, when retrieved briefly by four Glasgow students in 1950. Uh, this set in train a much wider series of movements around England and Scotland, including the breaking and repairing of the stone and the creation of a series of souvenirs from some of the fragments. If they were a boy band, they'd been called the Chips of Destiny. The train of movements includes the return of the stone to Scotland in 1996, placed on display in Edinburgh Castle. Uh, and as I've already said, it will return briefly to England soon for the coronation of King Charles III, before then returning to Scotland, this time to the new museum in Perth. As a long-lived institution that began in the 18th century, Perth Museum will also seek to confront its own colonial past and its 19th century collecting practices. Such activities have, of course, been brought into even sharper focus in recent times 
in revisionary debates about colonialism. And this slide is especially for Gail. <coughs> in the case of the Colson statue, Bristol museums were a key part of the debate and worked brilliantly and imaginatively to capture that debate. There's another side to the debate shaped around the fluidity of statues, as this example, which we've already seen from Munich, uh, illustrates. Celebratory, commemorative, ethnic, symbolic, and metaphorical around the making of musical genius. These acts are not concerned with the morality of the artist, a contest currently evidenced by the claims and counterclaims around the Eric Gill statue outside the BBC in London. The Perth Society, as we've seen, was a male Enlightenment colonial institution, able to treat the world as its oyster, collecting-wise. In addition to its collection, it left a valuable set of records relating to its activities. In those pages, we can see the accepted normality of collecting through the privilege and exercise of political, economic, and military might, particularly in South, Southeast, and Southwest Asia. In 1836, Perth's son, Dr. James Riach, then employed by the British East India Company, was appointed the personal medical advisor to the Shah of Iran, mainly based in Tehran, in, in Tehrania. Soon afterwards, the Shah dismissed the British mission, siding instead with Russia, uh, and by 1839, Riach was back in Britain. He was clearly, though, in Iran at a slightly earlier date, based at the residence, residency of uh, the British in Bashir. As he cut his graffiti in 1826 at the Palace of Darius in Persepolis, and in, and, and in the 19th century, it was a hugely popular colonial activity for diplomats and their uh, related uh, 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 colleagues to cut their graffiti at Persepolis. That same year, he collected various building fragments from Persepolis and donated them to the Society in Perth. The details are starred on the right of this slide, or in the middle of this slide, um, which uh, is the account comes from the Society's minute book, which is quoted here in the Asiatic Journal and Monthly. This collecting imperative that linked the Society in Perth to the activ activities of empire in Southwest, Southwest Asia and the Indian subcontinent is further demonstrated by the preceding entry, <coughs> accessions of material looted from a temple in Rangoon. The account is graphically Eurocentric, on the one hand appreciating the technical accomplishments and beauty of the ancient writings, but on the other finding the hidden set of clearly sacred statues to be a disappointing stash of idolatrous figures. There's no meeting of minds here. That Eurocentric, Eurocentric colonial mindset is demonstrated explicitly by Riek himself in a subsequent donation of further Iranian material in 1830. This included an example of a Persian bagpipe, or Ney Ambana, procured from a maker of such pipes working in an Arab pastoral, pastoral tribe near Bashir and accompanied by a lengthy account by Riek, from which I quote just some salient comments. Its close resemblance in form, as well as in the character of the music produced from it, to the more improved instrument of the same name in Scotland, forms its chief and perhaps its only point of interest. And certainly, these constitute the only reason I have for presuming to suppose that so very rude an instrument could possibly be acceptable. If, however, the latter conjecture is correct, uh, and provided the society will receive the present as proof of my desire to contribute to its museum, it will be a source of gratification to me when any other opportunity allows for enabling me to add my might to the antiquarian stores with which my native city is already enriched. Riach then describes watching the pipe maker, who displayed very great command of the powers of his rude handiwork, 
He then explains the pipes are made from antelope skin and that they were used by the Persian or Turkish nomadic tribes of the mountains and the Arab tribes of the coast. The pipes were used to call livestock to celebrate marriages, feasts, and festivals. He continues that the sounds elicited on first hearing are not dissimilar to those of the Scottish variant, and that such pipes are instruments of great antiquity and geographic spread. He concludes, the difference between the very rude instrument now offered to the society and the imposing, handsome, warlike bagpipe of Scotland is very striking. But there seems little reason to doubt that the former is the true original of the latter. These two may well represent the present state of the inhabitants of the representative countries of Britain and Persia in which they are now found. The former, free, civilized, and enlightened, are yet in rapid and accelerating progress towards still incalculable improvements in all that is worthy of men and immortal creatures. While among the latter, the dark ignorance of the earliest ages has not only been perpetuated, but the unceasing oppressions of absolute tyrants and the benumbing influence of the false religion appear to have totally eradicated even those cheering symptoms of advancement and civilization which shone on this and the neighboring countries above a thousand years ago, and still retain the millions of these beautiful regions of the earth in the most debasing and brutifying state of demoralization and disgusting slavery. <clears throat> Contemporary non-society records also reveal that several of the leading members of the society were slave owners in the Caribbean and spent time, for example, in Guyana managing their plantations. Okay, I'm always there. The Society was formally established in 1784 and began re recording acquisitions in 1785 from both the local area and empire-wide. One of those uh, was a chap called uh, Ramsey. Uh, he was uh, 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 he trained as a doctor, became a ship surgeon, uh, went out to Australia and sent a lot of objects back which he collected from the Pacific. Uh, donated these in, in, in the 1830s. Uh, including this Tahitian mourner's costume, of which I think there are only eight that survive in the world, uh, and some of these objects from Australia. After he'd made that initial donation, we don't hear from him again, but he clearly carried on collecting this, this flax cloak that we see here, which was donated to the museum in the 1960s, uh, actually came, uh, uh, it was collected by him on a trip to uh, New Zealand just before he died, uh, and then we get, I'm guessing that that collection he, he still had was sold up at auction, someone bought a piece uh, and then later donated it to the museum, so it's, it's quite lucky really. But um, one of the key objects that he collected was this uh, cloak. Uh, <coughs> and this is what's known as a Kahu Kakapo cloak. Um, it's the only one of its kind in the world, there is no other. And uh, um, it's been uh, the subject of a lot of research recently. It's it's fundamental to one of the ways in which we're trying to address, address that colonial legacy. Uh, on the basis of looking at this, we've recently agreed uh, a memorandum of understanding with Te Papa Kongarea, the National Museum in New Zealand, and the selection of objects that's going to go into the new museum from, from this part of the world. They will co curate with us and they will give the understanding of what these objects mean in a Maori context as opposed to us just talking about how we remove them from that context in the, in the 19th century. We've had uh, work done, we've sent samples of, our, of the cloak back 
to New Zealand so that they can take DNA samples uh, from the feathers and also to help support the current conservation project, which is seeking to preserve the Kakapo uh, Paris, which is on the edge of extinction. So we're looking forward to, uh, to uh, the results of that, of that work. The final figure I want to deal with is, is, is Robertson, Colin Robertson. He was in a similar position. He worked for the fur trade companies on the northwest frontier in America and Canada gathered uh, a, a group of materials in the early 19th century, sent them back to his city of Perth and the society he was a member of, uh, including these quite rare Salish objects, uh, which he carefully detailed. The, the, the rarest uh, of, of the objects is this fabulous uh, uh, blanket, I like it's an unfortunate term. It has the status of, of a cloak, really, for a prestigious person. Uh, again, of this kind of weave and colour, there, there are only six examples, probably, uh, that survive. Each one uh, unique. And I want to finish by further elaborating how we're going to deal with uh, part of our colonial legacy. Uh, we are working closely both with Maori groups in, in the UK and, and Te Papa, as I've already in, indicated. And we've just had a project partnering with both Te Papa, the New Zealand Society in the UK, and uh, the British Museum, whose conservation expertise has been applied to making sure the cloak is up to going on display. As I say, we've signed, we've very recently signed this, this mem formal memorandum of understanding with Te Papa, which will, which, which is much longer term than uh, the, um, just what the displays that are coming up and will lead to really interesting developments, I think. There's the, there's the, there's the parrot. Uh, <coughs> Very vulnerable once man discovered New Zealand because it's the only flightless parrot in the world. But that meant that people and dogs could catch it really easily uh, and eat it and use it for other uh, cultural artifacts. I won't show all of this, but if we could have the second. My name is Mark Hall, part of the curatorial team at Perth Museum and Art Gallery up in Scotland. And I'm here at the British Museum because we're working with uh, colleagues in uh, conservation and, and world cultures on one of our Maori Teonga, a Kahu Kakapo feather cloak, which is the only one of its kind in the world. And stop it there. Uh, 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 it lasts for seven minutes, so. Do have a look at it. It, it, it. It's a really nice uh, piece of film that captures that project and its, and its wider significance. We hope. So we're actively exploring how we might develop co-curation practices, also with communities of the Northwest Coast of America and Canada, making contacts with various makers and community representatives through the good offices of the University of British Columbia. We have got a long ways to go in the Northwest Coast compared to, to what we're doing in, in, in New Zealand. But we hope that we, we can incorporate their understanding of what we create and make it authentically voiced. This will deprivilege the moments of acquisition in the 19th century as determining the entire future of these objects and bring into the museum other ways of knowing these often living and sacred objects. And I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.